squaring the circle, we'll get to that maybe, and China learns to write. Um, I have a few things here just about Chinese traditions as to what, what the invention of writing in China was all about. And maybe the earliest record um, just says that they cast bronze vessels and, and you've seen bronze vessels in the Art Institute, for instance, and you might know the earliest bronze vessels in China have these animal mask um, uh, ornamentation on them. The mythology about that is that they pictured the different kinds of, of animals that were, threaten, were threatening human civilization, and that was a way of um, teaching people if they were going into wild areas to be able to recognize the kinds of animals that would be a threat to their, uh, to their safety. Um, in terms of, of writing, you can see that uh, this is a kind of pictograph. Picturing uh, animals would, would give rise to the idea that you can actually depict this. You can communicate uh, something about the animals. Um, other, uh, probably the most famous legend about the beginnings of writing is not writing per se, but you know the I Ching, the classic of changes that has the 64 hexagrams that are made up of, um, well, they didn't leave. This is one of the things at the university. You know, we have computers in every room. Well, we don't have computers, but we have these, these fancy, AV racks and things, but trying to find chalk is always a problem. But you've seen these kinds of symbols. This is supposed to be the, the legend about how these symbols were, were invented. And the, the person in China, the Sage King, who invented all sorts of uh, uh, institutions of civilization, marriage, for instance, uh, supposed to have been uh, invented by this guy Baoshi or Fuxi. And it says that he looked up and saw the stars in the sky and the kinds of patterns they had, looked down at the, the topography of the ground. He looked at his own body. He looked at other things in the world. And from that, he invented this kind of writing as a, as a kind of distillation of these natural signs in the world. So it's, if this is writing, then that uh, uh, describes the invention of writing. If it's not quite writing yet, then we still need another step. Um, then we have the first dictionary in China uh, that was submitted to court in 100 AD. Uh, certainly, they didn't use A.D. in China, but this is in the Eastern Han Dynasty. And in the postface to this dictionary, it's a dictionary that includes about 9,600 Chinese characters and categorized under 540 different radicals or significs. Um, but there's a postface that um, gives a kind of theoretical overview of Chinese script. And it begins by talking about the invention of writing. And so you can see that it starts with the same guy, Bao Xi or Pao Xi or Fu Xi, um, inventing the, the hexagrams. And then it goes on to talk about a guy named Cang Jie, who was the secretary of the Yellow Emperor. So the Yellow Emperor, the Chinese regard themselves as descendants of the Yellow Emperor, a person who's supposed to have ruled China back about 3000 BC. Um, it's interesting that this name Tang Jie, the inventor of writing, is the term that is now used for the input methods of Chinese characters on computers. So um, there are different kinds of input methods, but the standard one is known as the Tang Jie input system. Uh, but he saw the tracks of birds and beasts. And knowing that their diverse patterns could be differentiated, 
he, for the first time, created writing with a brush and inscribing with a stylus, scratcher or with a knife, scratching characters. So um, looking at the, the tracks of birds and beasts. In fact, uh, one, of our, uh, uh, one of our presses in the States that was the first to really pioneer putting, uh, doing typesetting, Chinese typesetting with a computer is called Bird Track Press. And he, uh, he actually has on his title page, uh, every title page, this, this passage from the first dictionary of China. Um, so, he, uh, it says that he made up two different kinds of characters. One type of character that is a one, that is um, a, a, a direct depiction of the thing or the event. And then he made up zi, and it's the word that means to give birth to, to, uh, to nurture, but in this context, it means complex characters, characters that combine different elements um, to, to give another meaning. And let me go through and just look at the different types. He then divided these, these two major ideas, wen and zi. And indeed, the, the Chinese word for character today is simply a combination of this, wen zi. Um, that is pictographs, if you will, ideographs, perhaps, and complex characters. Um, but he divided it up into six different types. Um, so here, as you read through this, um, there's pictographs. There's, uh, on, there are things that depict the shape, that point to something. There are pictographs. There are things, there are characters that represent the sound. There are characters that bring two different meanings together. Um, there are also two other uh, categories, one of which is not really well understood, but um, it's, uh, it's turning the uh, and commenting on something. And then finally, there's uh, borrowed characters. Borrowed characters are pretty much straight rebus characters. So if you were to write a letter, dear John, and instead of writing dear as D-E-A-R, simply putting a picture of a deer in there, it's the same kind of idea that has been used in China since the, the earliest times. Um, pictures of characters. Uh, pic pointing out something. Um, the, the examples that he gives are Shang and Xia. And Shang was originally just written like this, a line that is above uh, the, the sort of horizon. Uh, Xia was just written like this. Nowadays, Shang is written like this and Xia like this. But in the earliest times, there was just a dot above the horizon or below the horizon. Um, so that dot points to something. Or the, uh, the first character on the, on the left over here is the word for your wrist. And it's a picture of a hand with a dot here on the wrist, indicating that it's a hand, but it's a special part of the hand. Or the second character is actually a pictograph of a knife with a dot on the edge of the knife, and that's the word for blade. Um, it's the character for blade. Or the, uh, the third one there is a, a man. It's the word for armpits. Um, uh, you know, we could go through each one of these um, the sixth one there in the middle is, is a word for the body, the, the torso. And you can see that there's a, a circle indicated about the midpoint of the body. Um, now, 
this works for some things, but you can see already for the body that it might indicate some confusion. Does that represent the body or does it mean the belly, for instance? Well, in, in some respects, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference whether it's the body or the belly. It's the same part of the body. But you can imagine that for other purposes, we'd want to know, is it the body that you're talking about or is it the belly? Um, the second category of characters are these pictographs. Lots of people think that Chinese characters are pictographic. Though if, let's see if I can get the, if you were to look at this particular character, would you know that that is a sheep? Probably not. You might. Um, you certainly wouldn't know that that's an elephant. Um, although if you looked at the earliest form of the character, so this one here, you can probably make out that that's a, a kind of animal that has horns that go up and point down. Um, the, the elephant, you know, with the, with the trunk coming out is fairly recognizable. Um, the rabbit there in, the, in a bronze inscription from the earliest time is sort of understandable. These are all pictographs. Now, of course, as the language evolved, they grew away from their pictographic origins, but that doesn't mean that they're not pictographs. So they, um, they do represent these different things. So the moon, uh, the mountains, you can see, um, you know, here, this is an arrow, uh, a door. Uh, as long as, as you follow the development of the script, it's easy enough. Everyone's agreed that those are pictographs. Now, I threw all of these things on here. This is the third category according to this earliest dictionary in China. And it is the category that combines a, a root, so a, a signific, something that indicates the, the, the part of the world or the, uh, the kind of category that we're talking about together with a sound. Because you can imagine that you can, you can draw a picture of a tree. Yeah, this is, this is a tree. Uh, but if you wanted to differentiate between an oak tree, for instance, and a willow, well, maybe, maybe you could do that um, with certain ways, certainly. The, the, the mulberry tree, for instance, was, was it, has its own character because they represented the mulberries hanging all over the tree. But for most trees, you can imagine the difference between a pine tree and an oak tree would be very hard to represent. And the way that they got around this problem was to combine the word for tree. So all the trees are made up with that element and then adding to it the sound of that tree. So you can imagine writing with this character and putting beside it OAK or something like that. Um, the word in Chinese that is the word for oak or the word that is the word for pine. Um, so this is the way um, many of these characters were created. Um, and if I had time, I'd go, go through each one of these. But you know what? I, I think I don't have time, so I'm going to go on to the next category, which is combined meanings. And we could have, we, we could have uh, fun guessing at what, what all of these are. Um, who wants to try the very first one right here? Uh, Anyone know what that is? Water. Water. No, it's a good guess, but no. Um, one of the things you have to know is that from a very early time, Chinese flipped characters on, on a sort of uh, uh, 
vertical axis, things that would, if, if we had plenty of space, you might write this way, horizontally, but because Chinese was written from top to bottom, they tended to flip these things. This, part of this, sleeping, hey, there you go. This is a bed, this part of it. This is a man on the bed, but this is a man on the bed with water coming off of him, and it is, it's thought that that water probably represents sweat, so someone who has a fever, that's the word for sick, sickness. Um, how about this one? So this, this guy over here is in fact a guy, a person, seen in profile. So this is actually two people seen in profile. You can imagine two people in profile meaning all sorts of different things. In this case, it means to follow. Okay, this is the standard word for the verb to follow. And these, it's the verbs. You, you can imagine that the nouns are usually fairly easy to depict. How do you, how do you depict a verb? Running, you might be able to do it by showing somebody running. But follow, you need to put two things together. This one, it's kind of the opposite of follow, but, but it actually, um, this is, this is the, the word, if you want to go to Beijing and you want to tell them that you know how to write the original form of the, the bay in Beijing the, the, that means north, but it's back to back, or it ends up being the word for back um, because it's two guys who are back to back. Uh, so it doesn't mean, you could imagine that it would mean to go in opposite directions. But in fact, it uh, here just means back to back. And then because Chinese always built their houses facing south so that they would get the sun in all day, then back became north um, because that's, that's the direction that was to the back. One last fun with games here. Uh, anyone want to? Guess at this one. This guy on the right is that hand. Remember I showed you a picture of wrist because it was a, a dot on this part of the hand. That's a hand taking an ear. Um, and it means to take, to take by the ear probably because in ancient warfare uh, you, you showed your, your trophies. The Indians took the scalp. In ancient China, they took an ear. They cut an ear off. Um, for whatever reason, you can imagine a hand grabbing something as being to take. Uh, how about this one? See, this is why I had problems putting this talk together, because I tell you, I could talk about each one of these. Yeah? No, in fact, it doesn't have that sense at all. Um, and so, you know, whether it does in the earliest, the earliest materials, but even there, I think it doesn't have that sense. So just why it was that the ear, um, you know, a lot of this, the, the earliest record we have of the language that's, that reflects, is kind of self-reflective about the principles behind the writing is 1,300 years removed from the earliest forms of writing. So the people who were creating these things didn't leave us any, any rationale for why they came up with this. So some of it is a guessing game. I mean, most, most of these characters, I think we have 
a pretty good understanding of how they came about. These, these are basic characters, so you know, they, they appear everywhere. Um, and, and in that case, no, it doesn't seem to be violent. Um, how about this one here? Huh? Within the, door. within the door, but this actually is a special, a special sense of within the door. Notice that there are two hands, but they're pushing. This is to open, open the door. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, some of these are, are understandable. Now, um, There, the University of Chicago was implicated very early on in one of the, the more celebrated debates about the Chinese language, at least in the Western world. The person who uh, established our program in Chinese studies at the university uh, was a professor named Hurley Creel. Uh, he lives on at the university in the form of me, uh, he uh, was just talking at lunch that uh, people say when, when you have one of these titles, so I am the Hurley G. Creel Professor of Ancient China on campus. Um, you know, there, there are other people who have endowed professorships that might be, you know, you can imagine the Lehman Brothers Professor <laughs> of Finance. Um, uh, I know someone who's the Burlington Northern Professor of uh, of Chinese civilization. Uh, it used to be that endowed chairs were named after famous professors who uh, passed away. Uh, in my case, I actually get uh, both sides of that because Hurley Creel was uh, a very famous professor of ancient Chinese things. Uh, he also when he died, left all of his money to the university and with the proviso that it be for the support of the study of ancient China. And so the university took all of his money and then took my position off of their books and put it onto the endowed fund and made me the Hurley Creel professor. Um, anyways, in 1936, Hurley Creel uh, published an article in the journal Tungbao where he argued the Chinese characters are ideographic. And he was looking at the kinds of characters that we just looked at, pushing a door open, taking, taking an ear as being to take. The next year, a professor at the University of California at Berkeley named Peter Budberg wrote an article published in the Harvard Journal of Asiatic Studies in which he launched the scathing attack on Hurley Creel and said, you don't understand how language works. Languages are not <laughs> ideographic. They can't possibly be. Language is secondary. Language is the speech that we, that we do. So if you go to the linguistics department, they will tell you um, that they are only interested in the way people speak, that that's language and writing systems are secondary. Um, and that writing systems are only intended to represent speech. This person, William G. Boltz, uh, the origin and early development of the Chinese writing system, was a student of Budberg's. And he wrote a book about 20 years ago in which he reprised this debate. And he says that in the process of the origin and development of the writing system, there's no provision for characters to be formed as combinations of two or more constituent elements, none of which has a phonetic role. What he's suggesting is that all of these characters, all of these sort of complex characters, are like that word for oak tree that I said, if you can imagine a tree with something else added to it representing the sound. Whether, whether you would write it out as O-A-K or use another word in Chinese that would, uh, would represent that. Um, 
And, it, and then he says, nowhere else in the Chinese writing system or in any other natural writing system that I know of, is there a type of graph that stands for a word on the basis of the combination of elements? So he's leaving open the possibility that there were pictographs originally that then by convention came to represent a word, but only through the sound. Uh, but he says there, there would never be a kind of word that would combine two different meanings. So one of the words the Chinese people always point to is the word for brightness. And in Chinese script, it's a combination of the sun and the moon. So the sun and the moon, you can, I mean, you could think of all sorts of other meanings that the sun and the moon might give, but brightness makes sense, and all of this, after all, is conventional. So, you know, why, why do we write guest, G-U-E-S-T, uh, instead of with some other combination of letters, you know, eventually, or, or why do we write night, N-I-G-H-T, as opposed to N-I-T-E? You know, I, I think I know why we do, but... Speech must exist before a word is invented. Right. I mean, that's a postulate. The speech must exist before the word. But can the word ever exist before the speech? That's yeah, that's that's a good question. To what if to what extent does the way we write something affect the way we say something? There, there's no question at all that speech exists before writing. Can, has there ever been a case where a word existed before the spoken word was invented? Um, I don't know if, if we can imagine a, a word that exists before the spoken word is like, in. Like you something. Okay, I, someone just asked me at lunch. I told him Chinese is really simple. It's a very easy language. Um, and he couldn't believe it, and he said, well, uh, is it inflected for um, singular plural? Nope. Um, past tense, future tense? Nope. Nope. Um, gender? Nope. Everything is the same gender. He, she, it. No, in spoken Chinese, he, she, it is all the same word. But in the 1920s in China, people were feeling a little bit disadvantaged because of that. And so they created new words for she and it. Um, so that he, or simply the, the third person pronoun, was always written this way. And this is the, the component that means person. Person probably gendered, probably a male, but not necessarily. But in order to specify that we want this not to be he, but she, they came up with a new side component that is a woman the female signific, and when you write it that way, then it means specifically she. They uh, also had a word for it, and then someone said, Christian missionaries actually uh, came up with a new word, said, oh, well, we can make this, pronounced exactly the same, you'd never, you'd never be able to know by the pronunciation component. Um, these are those last two car uh, categories that I'm not going to spend time with here. Um, and Boltz was particularly exercised about the idea of an ideograph. As I say, pictograph is something that he can, he can understand. But an ideograph, he really doesn't like it. And he says that all the way back in the 1840s, one of the first dissertations on the Chinese language, on Chinese writings, um, 
already dispelled this notion of ideographs, that it, it entered into our Western conception because um, in the 17th century, there was a, a, a strange, uh, I think he was German, Athanasius Kircher, who, uh, who was fascinated with Egyptian hieroglyphs. And he introduced the word ideograph. And Kircher was actually also interested in Chinese. I'm going to just skip through some of these next things. Um, one of our professors was actually giving a talk right at the same time, Han Saucy, talking about oral literature. Um, but uh, here is uh, where, where he, he has done something. This is from a book that Athanasius Kircher published in 16, I don't know, 1670 or so. Um, what he was also interested in the Chinese writing system. If you ask Egyptologists, they'll tell you that he made a complete mess of hieroglyphics. He also made a complete mess of Chinese characters. But he's the one who introduced the idea of ideographs. And so here is the, the 1930s ideography debate. And then you see that Peter Budberg, who had a, a, a rather vicious streak in him, somebody who pulled your ear when you were in his class, um, uh, wrote the final, the final contribution to the debate of that period called ideography or iconology, iconolatry. Um, that uh, this, is, this, is, this is completely unscientific. Bill. How did your word uh, come into the Chinese language? Sure. Start somewhere and then it's, it just grows? Or? Yeah, it's, it, it has grown by the, the principle that they talk about, taking a, a, a root of a word and adding a sound to it. So in the oracle bone inscriptions of 1200 BC, there are about 1,500 characters or so that can be differentiated. And about 50% of those are pictographic. Um, in fact, trying to find, to understand the, the phonetic component, there are only about 20% or so that, that have a readily identifiable phonetic component. Though they, they already were using this principle to make, to make words. Yeah, they've thought about it a lot. Um, and they don't want, no. Um, Chinese characters work perfectly well for them. Um, there was concern in the 1980s that, that computerization would not be compatible with Chinese characters. It has proven to be perfectly compatible. Um, you know, all of this is very easy to do on computers. China has used its writing system for 3,000 years. By 1750, they say there were more books in Chinese than in all the other languages of the world combined. They've produced a, a wonderful civilization based on this writing system. It has served, it has served them very well. As a linguist, do you think that one or the other system offers advantages for communication or literature or whatever? Sure. I, first of all, I, I'm not a linguist, really. I, I'm a dilettante who <laughs> jumps between various fields. Um, I think that some lang different languages have different advantages and different disadvantages. I think that Chinese, the Chinese script allows people to, um, to write in ways and express themselves in ways that aren't necessarily available to people using a, an alphabetic language. Alphabetic languages allow us to do all sorts of things that Chinese can't do. Um, one of the things that, that we can do is, uh, is, is to uh, uh, represent sounds a little bit closer to what the sound actually does sound like, whereas, you know, but we don't do a very good job of that either. If, if your stomach, if your stomach rumbles, right, you're hungry, uh, what's it say in English? Brown. But it doesn't sound like that. The Chinese have a special term for your stomach. The noise that your stomach makes 
when it's hungry, and it says that your stomach goes gula gula gula. Um, partially because they have to write it with characters that exist in the Chinese language. They can't just make up sounds for which they don't have characters. Um, so that's it. That's a disadvantage. But in some ways, it's an advantage, too. I don't know. Um, but I, I, was, I was responding to this question about the invention of new words. By the next stage of the language, roughly from 1000 to 800 BC, that which we know primarily by inscriptions on bronze vessels. So if you go to the Art Institute, you'll see that they have a number of bronze vessels there with um, inscriptions on the inside of them. And that language, only about, uh, so by then there are more like 2,500 to 2,700 different characters that are known. And now we go from something like 60% pictographs down to more like 40, 35 to 40% pictographs. And the interesting thing is that most of the newly invented characters are invented on this phonetic principle. By 100 AD, with that dictionary that I was talking about, there are 95, 9,600 characters in that dictionary. And most people would say something like 90% of the characters in that dictionary are actually phonetic compounds. They represent the, the word by the phonetic. The most complete dictionary today has about 55,000 characters in it. Most of these characters, I mean, these are complete dictionaries. If a word has ever appeared anywhere, then it gets entered into the dictionary. 99% of those characters are phonetic compounds. Um, for instance, um, this character, anyone know what this? Aluminum. Aluminum. This is the, the radical for metal. Anything having to do with metallurgy is entered under this significant. And then, when aluminum was invented, how do, you, how do you translate aluminum into Chinese? And this is pronounced lü. And so it was added to the metal to, to make aluminum. So just, just that character itself. You could have, if you wanted, and sometimes, well, the Japanese have, have usually just um, borrowed the sounds. So television in Japanese is telebi, um, you know, and lots of lots and lots of foreign foreign concepts and foreign uh, items are just represented phonetically. But in Chinese, they actually have made new characters. Almost all the characters are made on this basis: one um, semantic component and one phonetic component. And I'm going to jump all the way, see how much I have here for you guys? Um, actually, I'll tell you a little secret. I, actually, I, I knew this was way too much for an hour talk here, but on Monday I'm going to go over to the Oriental Institute and talk to the, uh, the ancient Near Easternists, and uh, they want me to bring all of this material together. Um, oh, here's, here's, a, here's an interesting case. This is for Chinese, about writing phonetically. Um, you might have heard that in mainland China they now use simplified characters. So in the 1950s they started, they thought, you know, if we're ever going to teach all of these people to learn to read and write, Chinese characters are too difficult, so let's simplify them. Um, and so this is, this is two simplifications. One that was done in the 1950s, um, this is a character, and do I have it here? No. Somewhere, somewhere later in my materials I have this. But the, the, the bottom character here is the, uh, the traditional form for precious, and it combines jade and the 
what was the word for money in original times under a roof. So it has the treasure or precious or something like that. When it was simplified in the 1950s, they got rid of, there, there's also a phonetic component in this character on the left here. Um, this is pronounced bow, and this portion of the character is a kind of pot, but it's pronounced fo, which was close in pronunciation to this character. And so they added that to it to represent the sound. But in the 1950s, when they simplified this character, they, they took just the one most precious thing from it, which is the jade, and put jade under a roof, and it doesn't have any phonetic component at all. Which is not to say this wasn't originally a, a, a complex character that combined semantic and phonetic elements. But when they simplified it, they got rid of the phonetic element. On the other hand, on the top is, uh, this is the traditional character for liquor, for alcohol. Um, and it was originally a pictograph on, on the right of a vase into which you would put water, put, put wine, and on the left is the water signific, anything fluid, anything having to do with fluids. In 1981, they tried, let's see, they tried to simplify this character, and they said, one of the easiest graphs in Chinese that everyone knows is this thing on the right, which is just the number nine. Everybody knows how to write to 10. You know, if you go out into the, the countryside, everybody knows how to write their name and how to write one to 10. So everyone will know how to write this character. And it just so happens that it's a perfect homophone for the word for liquor. They're both pronounced jo in the third tone. It's a perfect way to write it. Nobody liked this simplification. <laughs> they got rid of this. They, you know, if you're going to write like that, you may as well just write in romanization. Um, and by doing that, they lost the original semantic context of this component on the right. Um, look how many things I've got. I could talk all day. Whoops, now, there. So this is the, the thing that that component on the right of Joe was originally representing. It's a pretty good drawing of this kind of vase that was used for um, uh, liquor. Now, I wish I knew where. Yeah, this is, this is where I want to square the circle for you. Uh, and I have one minute. <laughs> uh, that guy right in the top of the, the first line is a circle. Um, it has a pronunciation in Chinese, is ding. And uh, probably it was in origin a nail head like a thumbtack. You can see uh, about a thousand years after the character was created, it was written in this way that reflects the nail. It comes to mean, it's part of a, a, an extended word family that has meanings of to be secure, um, to make firm. Uh, it also, what's this character? Anyone know this guy? This is a cauldron, which was round. Chinese cauldrons were always, not always, but usually round. Um, and they're three-legged things. Three-legged things are always secure, right? Four-legged chairs tend to wobble, but a three-legged chair is secure. Um, the cauldron came to be a symbol of government 
so that this character actually was also um, used here for to be upright. So two feet under this character. This, this gave the character both its semantic sense that something is secure, that you're secure on your feet, but also provided the pronunciation, that this was pronounced ting originally, and the, the, nail, the nail head was pronounced ting, this was pronounced ting. All of these different words in Chinese were pronounced ting. But I want to just get real quickly to this, or this one. What's that? A person. But it's a person because the, the graph for person doesn't have this. It accentuates the head. And in fact, there's a word also originally pronounced ting that represents the crown of the head, so the top of the head. This comes to mean also anything big, important, high, it's the word for heaven, tian. Um, and as the word for t heaven, written like this, you can see here that in origin, this character was a circle on top. And then it was hard cutting into turtle shell to make circles, so they tended to make squares. And then they said, simplifying the, the language, is, the script has been simplified at each step along the way. Why should we make a square? We can just draw a single line. And in fact, this round head on this guy ended up just being a stroke across there. And everyone thinks in Chinese that heaven is written this way, and they don't know what that top line means. It was there both to represent the head, originally, but it was forgotten very early on, and also the pronunciation of the character. Um, if we had another hour or two, uh, I'd, I'd love to talk more about this word family and all of these characters, but you guys have other, other talks to go off to. And I've got to go home and cook dinner tonight. So anyways, it's been a delight to be here. Um, Chinese is great fun.